Everything we see around us is in color because of the light from the sun. Sunlight is a mixture of colors, which, however, can be seen only when it is split up by droplets of water, for instance, to form a rainbow. Let us imitate this effect by causing sunlight or white artificial light to pass through a prism. By mixing these colors in various combinations, we can make an infinite variety of new colors. If we add all of the colors of the rainbow together, we once more obtain white light. Surprisingly, this can also be done by mixing green, blue and red light only. Furthermore, light of these three colors, if mixed in the right proportions, will give almost any other color desired. In theory, therefore, a color picture could be built up from green, blue and red images only. This is in fact what happens in color television. Special filters in the color camera separate the picture into its three basic color images. These are then converted by the camera into electrical signals. These signals are transmitted to the receiver. There they are recombined to give one picture, apparently in full natural color. But if we examine the picture through a magnifying glass, we see only a pattern of green, blue and red dots. There are in fact three images on the screen, one for each of the three basic colors. The dots are so small, however, that the eye cannot resolve them and sees only one multicolored image. The colors mix then in the eye of the viewer. The color picture is reproduced by the picture tube. The most important parts of this tube are the three gun assembly, the neck with its cone, the faceplate with its shadow mask, and the metal rim band. The shadow mask fits inside the faceplate, which is coated with a fluorescent screen. Each gun provides an electron beam for its own color. These beams pass through holes in the shadow mask and hit the screen. Behind each hole there are three fluorescent dots, one green, one blue and one red. The mask ensures that each electron beam can hit only its own dots which then light up. This simple explanation of how the color tube works contrasts greatly with its complex manufacture. Manufacture begins with an accurately measured amount of glass, which is pressed in a mold to form the cone. Face plates are pressed in the same way, one every 10 seconds. Before the faceplate is taken to the annealing oven, the supports by which the shadow mask will later be secured are fused in. The machine positions the faceplate so that each support is located exactly at the right point. The radius of curvature of each faceplate is measured electronically at 48 points.
the outside dimensions too are checked for accuracy. The edge of the cone is precision ground to ensure a perfect fit with the faceplate. Thin metal sheets for the shadow mask. They are passed through a degreasing plant to clean them thoroughly. They then arrive in a dust-free room illuminated by sodium lamps. The photosensitive emulsion with which both sides of the sheet are now being coated is unaffected by this yellow light. The wet coating is dried in a carefully controlled atmosphere. Once dry, the photosensitive sheet is clamped in a frame between two negatives. Each negative carries a pattern of nearly half a million black dots. The sheet is now exposed to light through both negatives. During the exposure, the emulsion hardens and becomes insoluble. The unexposed dots are washed away to provide holes in the hardened emulsion for the etching process. The black dots on one negative are smaller than those on the other. Because of this, the holes in the emulsion are smaller on one side of the sheet than on the other. The etching process therefore makes tapered holes in the sheet. If the holes were cylindrical, some of the electrons would be reflected and thus strike the wrong phosphor dots. The tapering prevents this. The holes in each mask are checked for shape and size, both visually and electronically. Deformation of the mask is prevented by this reinforcing frame. To the frame are fitted the springs which will anchor the mask to the supports in the faceplate. The mask is pressed into the correct shape without any distortion of the etched holes. The mask and its frame are blackened in an oven. This makes for better heat dissipation when the mask is subjected to electron bombardment. Finally, the mask is welded to the frame. Back to the faceplate. This is thoroughly cleaned with a dilute acid solution and then rinsed with deionized water. The green, blue and red phosphor suspensions are carefully prepared. Phosphor mixtures are prevented from settling by vibration agitators. They are checked just before use for specific gravity, viscosity, and electrical resistance. Moreover, every batch is color checked. A sample is taken from each batch, dried, and viewed under ultraviolet light, which reveals the color characteristic of the phosphor. Starting with the green phosphor suspension, an accurate amount is poured into the faceplate. The spinning motion distributes the suspension evenly over the entire surface of the faceplate. It is dried by infrared radiation. Because photosensitive materials are involved, 
This area too is lit by sodium lamps. Great care is taken to exclude dust and an air conditioning system maintains the correct temperature and humidity. A numbered shadow mask is inserted in the faceplate with its green phosphor layer. The faceplate is marked with the same number and from now on this faceplate and this mask are permanently paired. The green phosphor layer is exposed to ultraviolet light using the shadow mask as a negative. In this way, the pattern of holes in the mask is projected onto the phosphor layer. The position of the light source is critical. The light must strike the phosphor at exactly the same points as will the corresponding electron beam. The action of the light hardens the phosphor so that the exposed dots adhere firmly to the faceplate. After the mask has been removed from the faceplate, the unexposed phosphor is washed off. The faceplate now carries a regular pattern of green phosphor dots. The blue phosphor suspension is poured into the faceplate. The complete process is repeated, but now the light source is positioned at the point where the blue gun will be in the finished tube. For the red phosphor, the light is emitted from the red gun position. The completed screen now consists of a regular pattern of nearly one and a half million phosphor dots. After each stage of the process, the dots are checked for shape and size with a microscope. The phosphor screen is now backed by a very thin layer of aluminium. This acts as a mirror and ensures that all the light produced by the phosphors is radiated forwards. The shadow mask is now permanently secured to the faceplate. Spring contacts are welded onto the shadow mask. These will later connect the mask to the electrical circuit of the receiver. The faceplate is now ready for fixing to the cone. To the edge of the cone, a glass bonding paste is applied. The faceplate is positioned with extreme accuracy by means of a special jig. The assembly passes into an oven where faceplate and cone are hermetically joined. The tube envelope is now ready for the gun assembly to be sealed in. This consists of three electron guns, one for each color. The guns are assembled simultaneously in a special jig to ensure that their electron beams will intersect precisely in the holes in the mask. Each gun assembly consists of more than 70 components. Such is the standard of accuracy required that assembly tolerances are measured in microns. Gun assembly. Inspection has taken place at every stage of its manufacture to ensure that it meets the exacting standards of reliability and performance required. Now the gun assembly is carefully located and sealed in the neck of the tube.
The tube is evacuated and sealed off. On the way to the next process, the cathodes of the three guns are activated. Finally, a metal rim band is cemented around the faceplate to reinforce the tube. This construction does away with the need for a safety shield. The quality of the direct vision picture is thus considerably improved. The colour television picture tube is now complete. Before leaving the factory, however, it is thoroughly tested. The measurements made of cut-off voltage, emission, white field uniformity, vacuum, brightness, convergence and beam landing are only some of the many checks carried out. tubes are sent to the packing department. From there they are dispatched to customers in many parts of the world. Colour adds a new dimension to the world of television and the key component of any colour television receiver is its picture tube. 